Has anyone ever given you an answer to something that left you wondering what question they were answering because it sure as hell wasn't the one you asked? Or maybe someone told you a random thought which made you existentially question the entirety of human existence. It will probably come as no surprise that I have strange conversations with people, including my parents. I don't remember the context, but I clearly remember my father saying to me when I was little, I wonder who first looked at a sea urchin and said, I want to eat that. I'll explore that more at the end of the video, but the question has stayed with me and brings me to the topic of culinary delicacies. Sea urchin is definitely considered one, and in Japan, so are puffer fish, or as they call them, hugu. Hugu has a tetrodotoxin that is 1,200 times more poisonous than cyanide. It is so deadly that one puffer fish has enough toxin to kill 30 adult humans. This is probably why the Japanese have a haiku, well, nothing happened, even though yesterday I ate hugu soup. The Japanese have a long history with hugu. These fish have inspired things like children's toys, folk art, and souvenirs. Their skin is used to create decorations, wallets, and waterproof boxes. But today we are going to look at hugu chochin and go back in time to medieval Japan and the time of the shoguns. Welcome to Curious People Wanted. I'm Dr. Darren Raymond Locke, curator of the Barnum Museum. Puffer fish have been part of Asian material culture and food pathways since the Neolithic period. The Kiribati use their skins for helmets, and while in Korea and Japan, puffer fish bones have been found in garbage heaps dating back at least 2,300 years, it's safe to say that the preparation of these fish have been a long-standing tradition. But with a fatality rate of 6.8% and the hospitalization of up to 65 people a year, the preparation and serving of hugu in Japan is actually regulated by law. In order to serve puffer fish, chefs have to go through a specialized three-year training course, which culminates in a test. If they pass this exam, they will get a license. But interestingly, only about 35% of those who take the exam actually pass. Okay, so let's back up a bit. Let's start simple. Why am I talking about puffer fish, AKA hugu? I'm talking about hugu because when I opened a box in the collections labeled Japanese lantern, I was not expecting to find this. This is a hugu chochin, which translates to puffer fish lantern. And yes, in person, it is everything you can imagine and more. Today, these lanterns are made by taking the fresh skin of a puffer fish, filling it with sawdust, wiring the tail to the back to give it this arched look, and letting it dry. The filling and wires are then removed, leaving the skin with this inflated appearance. The wooden ring is inserted into the hole in the back originally used to fill the fish with sawdust, and then attached to the skin. The wire in the ring allows the lantern to hang wherever a person would like it to. Our lantern dates to approximately 1900, but lanterns like this one entered other museum collections earlier during the mid to late 19th century. But by 1925, Hugu Chochin had reached a significant level of popularity. They were sold as souvenirs and I believe still are. So channeling my dad for a moment, who first saw a puffer fish and thought, if inflated, that would be an amazing lantern. I'm so glad you asked. While the origin of the Hugu Chochin is not really known, Lanterns made from fish bones date back as far as the 13th century in Japan and may have originated even earlier in China. This lantern style seems to be attested as early as the reign of Emperor Go Horikawa, which spanned between 1221 and 1232 AD. I couldn't find too much information from this early period, but around 1400, a medieval Japanese writing called the Aki no Yo no Naga Managatari, which uh, translates to a long tail for an autumn night, talks about lanterns. In this story, a Buddhist monk uses a Gaiono no Chochin to light his way to a temple. This Gaiono no Chochin is made from a fish head, which was boiled until translucent and filled with fireflies for ambient light. There is still a lot of debate about what this early lantern looked like and how the skull of the fish helped to provide a structure. But these lanterns were hanging things. They weren't meant to collapse, unlike Japanese paper lanterns. Sometime around 1700, a documentary source that Oshi Yoshio, the leader of the 47 Ronin, 
made a Yumi of fish bones. A Yumi is a type of bow that holds a lantern and one that Yoshio invented was actually foldable. There are a few other reputable sources that I could read that helped reconstruct the history of fishbone lanterns and specifically Hugu Chochin. So I began looking into the historical use of Hugu as food to see if that would maybe help. And what I found was actually very interesting. Okay, so to answer this question, I have to do what I initially complained about and answer a question that wasn't asked. So let's talk medieval Japanese history and feudal society first. During the 16th century, Japan was not a unified country. It was divided into clans. The emperor was a figurehead and the real power held by a shogun who were the heads of the army and the civil, diplomatic, and judicial authority of Japan. Through much of the 1500s, the shogunate was held by the Ashikaga family. However, in 1573, a daimyo, the Japanese equivalent of a feudal lord named Oda Nobunaga overthrew the Ashikaga and claimed the shogunate for himself. But his ultimate goal was to unify Japan. Nobunaga would never achieve this goal. He was killed in 1582. His successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, was born a peasant, but by 1570, he had gained enough power and notoriety by serving in Nobunaga's military forces that his name actually starts showing up in documents. Hideyoshi decides to continue Nobunaga's plan to unify Japan, and he is successful. So here's the hitch and the thing to keep in mind, really. Real shoguns, the legitimate heirs to that title, were descendants of the Minamoto clan. The Minamoto family was a branch of the emperor's family, but stemmed from a younger son who would never become ruler. Hideyoshi was not related to the Minamoto and, as a result, was illegitimate. Right, so let's fast forward to 1598. Hideyoshi dies after being sick for months. He's succeeded by his five-year-old son, Toyotomi Hideyori. Don't worry, the kid doesn't lead anybody into battle. But in 1600, an actual descendant of the Minamoto clan and the legitimate heir to the shogun title, a guy named Tokugawa Iyasu, meets Hideyori forces at Sekigahara and defeats him in battle. Tokugawa Iyasu receives the title of shogun on March 24th, 1603, and a new period called the Edo period, or Tokugawa period, begins in Japan. This period lasts until 1868. So why did I just tell you all of that? The Tokugawa shogunate ushers in a period in Japanese history during which hugu consumption is banned, at least in their area of influence, which included Tokyo. In Western Japan, it continued to be eaten, which may suggest that its bones were easier to access and incorporate into other uses, including lanterns in these areas. Perhaps the style of lanterns were used there, or at least were more common in those places. That is not to say they were not used elsewhere, and certainly this does not mean that fishbone lanterns weren't constructed from other fish. I should also acknowledge that paper lanterns have long been in use by this point too, I can't find why the shogunate banned hugu. I have seen various reports, but the most reputable ones suggest that there was a mass poisoning of soldiers in Toyotomi Hideyoshi's army, and the consumption of hugu was subsequently forbidden. I don't read Japanese though, and I could not find translated historical documents to confirm this. Interestingly, while the ban on hugu consumption was lifted after the fall of the shogunate in 1868, it rose to popularity again but there was a renewed ban in several places. The emperor was even banned from eating the dish. Apparently the Imperial Household Agency has since lifted that ban, but it is likely that no emperor from about 1600 to 1989 ate the fish. And that, my friends, is the story of and tangents associated with our Hugu Chochin. All right, I promise to talk about sea urchin. I personally look at them as edible pincushions and have absolutely no desire to try them. But I too have questions about how certain foods can actually be incorporated into diets. I'd love to be able to tell you that in 853, after observing two friends try and fail at eating a sea urchin, that a man named Ichiro successfully prepared uni for the first time. I can't. I actually didn't find too much about the incorporation of sea urchin into the human diet. In Japan, they were being eaten by at least the 9th century, and in Canada, 
Evidence shows that they were on the menu much earlier, almost 4,500 years ago. If you're interested though, there is actually something called Foodways Archaeology, which examines the intersection of food, history, culture, and tradition as seen in the archaeological record. Reconstructing food resources, especially plant foods, can be difficult, but archaeologists are nothing if not persistent and patient. In 2015, there was a big project that looked at dental calculus. Yep, that's right, ancient tooth tartar. Epipaleolithic human specimens from Spain showed that flossing had yet to become a revolution 12,000 to 18,000 years ago. The teeth still had micro remains, which allowed archaeologists to identify certain types of food people were eating, including things like mushrooms. Also, then there's Utsi. Utsi was a man who died around 5,300 years ago during the Chocolithic period. In 1991, his mummified body was found frozen in the Alps. He was so well preserved that researchers have been able to analyze his intestinal tract to identify specific plant fauna that was part of his diet and confirm that his last meal actually involved a feast of ibex and venison. Anyway, thanks for joining me today and if you have any questions or want me to do a video on something specific or expand on something I've said, please comment below. Remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel, but most importantly, remember to stay curious.